Our scripture reading for today is from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah served as a prophet to the southern kingdom of Israel called Judah over 700 years before Jesus was born. His message was essentially twofold, words of judgment and words of promise. Isaiah was critical of how the people had turned from God. They failed to worship God and to walk in God's ways. But Isaiah was also very clear in sharing the promise of God's coming kingdom. He told of the Messiah to come who would make all things right. Our scripture reading for today has two parts. I'm going to try to help prepare you to hear it. First, we're going to hear about a terrifying time in the history of ancient Israel. The Assyrian Empire had risen to power and had conquered all the surrounding nations, including Hamath and Arpad and Sepharvim and the northern kingdom of Israel called Samaria. The southern kingdom of Israel, Judah, was next on their agenda. King Sennacherib of Assyria sent the Rabshaka, like his foreign ambassador, to Judah with a message. The Rabshaka met with the king's court, Eliakim, Shebna, and Joah. And in their own language, the Rabshaka taunted them to convince them to just give up and surrender. He told them their God couldn't save them, that it would be better just to give up. Well, King Hezekiah, who was one of the few good and faithful kings over the years, was deeply distressed by this. So he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth, which is how they showed grief and fear. He'd already witnessed the destruction of the northern kingdom, and he was afraid for his own people. So he sent his chief of staff, Eliakim, to the prophet Isaiah asking for prayer. Isaiah told them not to be afraid, to hold on, and that God would take care of them. That's the first part of our reading. In the second part of our reading, in chapter 2, Isaiah offers a beautiful vision of a glorious future. All nations will worship the one true God and live in God's righteous ways. War and violence will be a thing of the past. We won't need swords or weapons anymore, only plows and gardening tools. Our readers can come forward as we listen to these holy words from the prophet Isaiah. We hear the voices of the narrator, the Rab Shaka of Assyria, Eliakim of Judah, and the prophet Isaiah. And I'm going to put that chart back up there to help you keep things a little straight. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah, King Sennacherib of Assyria came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. The king of Assyria sent the Rabshaka from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem with a great army. He stood by the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. And there came out to him Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, who was in charge of the palace, and Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, son of Asaph, the recorder. Then the Rabshakeh stood and called out in a loud voice in the language of Judah, Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you. Do not let Hezekiah make you rely on the Lord by saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, Make your peace with me and come unto me. Then every one of you will eat from your own vine and your own fig tree and drink water from your own cistern until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and wine a land of bread and vineyards. Do not let Hezekiah mislead you by saying, the Lord will save us. Has any of the gods of the nations saved their land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? 
Where are the gods of Hamath or Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvim? Have they delivered Samaria out of your hand? Who among all the gods of these countries have saved their countries out of my hand, that the Lord should have Jerusalem out of my hand? When King Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. And he sent Eliakim, who was in charge of the palace, and Shebna the secretary, and the senior priest covered with sackcloth, to the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. They said to him, So say Hezekiah, this day is the day of distress, of rebuke and disgrace. Children have come to the birth, and there is no strength to bring them forth. It may be that the Lord your God hear the words of Rebesiah, whom his master of the king of Assyria has sent him to mock the living of God. And he will rebuke the words that the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, lift up your prayer for the remnant that is left. When the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, Say to your master, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid because of the words that you have heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have reviled me. I myself will put a spirit in him, so that he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land. I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. This is the word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountains of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war any more. Or house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I ain't going to study war no more, ain't going to study war no more, ain't going to study war no more. Any of you know the song? Maybe you know it by another title. Down by the riverside, I'm going to lay down my sword and shield down by the riverside. The song became popular during the Vietnam War era as a protest song, but the song has roots way back in the 1850s African-American communities, even before the Civil War. The inspiration for the song is Isaiah's glorious vision of peace, of a world where swords would become plows and spears become pruning hooks, of a world where nation will not fight against nation and people shall not learn or study war anymore. We will cast off violence and aggression. We will all be baptized and washed in God's love. Down by the riverside, we will cross the water into God's promised land, either on earth or someday in heaven. Lord knows, and so do we, we need less war and more peace. I think even our military leaders can agree on that. A strong military can be a deterrent to war and an agent of peace. We can almost all agree that our world needs less violence and aggression, and we need more kindness and cooperation. But war is as old as humankind. The most common estimate among historians is that for the last 3,400 years of human history, the world has been at peace for 8% of the time. 
only 8%. We've been at war for 92% of human history. At least 108 million people were killed in wars in the 20th century alone. Estimates go as high as 1 billion people having been killed in wars in human history. According to the World Economic Forum, the financial cost of violence and conflict is staggering as well. Last year, wars cost the global economy over $1 trillion, a trillion dollars spent on war. In comparison, peace-building expenditures total only $10 billion, meaning we spend on peace only 1% of what we spend on war. It's time to change that. I looked through the 2017 Global Peace Index this week. It's a widely respected ranking of countries according to their safety, security, and domestic and international conflicts. Anyone know the most peaceful nation on earth? Ten years running? Anyone want to guess? It's Iceland, 10 years running for Iceland, followed by New Zealand, I heard that, Portugal, Austria, and Denmark. Europe remains the most peaceful region of the world. You might be able to guess the most war-torn nation, the least peaceful nation on earth. Any guess? That would be Syria. Over seven years of civil war now in Syria. Syria is followed by Afghanistan, Iraq, South Sudan, and Yemen. Those are home to the most deadly wars and conflicts right now. Where's the United States on the Global Peace Index? You think we're in the top half or the bottom half? What do you think? Number 114 out of 163, bottom half right between Rwanda and El Salvador. We've actually declined and become less peaceful in recent years. And for comparison, our neighbor Canada is number eight. Our neighbor Mexico is number 142. The world is currently host to more than 50 active wars and conflicts. 50 wars and conflicts. It's time for change. We need to stop fueling the war machine and start fueling peace-building efforts. We need less war and more peace, not only among the nations, but also in the nations, in our nation, in our communities, in our homes, in our hearts and minds. The prophet Isaiah offers us hope for exactly that, hope for less war. And more peace. Back in Isaiah's time, the Israelites were under extreme threat. The Assyrians were dominating the world. Every nation they approached was destroyed. The enemy army was at their gate. The foreign ambassador came to taunt Israel. The Rab Shaka was questioning their faith and tempting them away from trusting in God. They were being bullied. And they were afraid. And perhaps, hearing it that way, this challenging Bible story sounds and feels a little more familiar to us. At first, we might read this Bible story and wonder what it has to do with us. But then we read a little closer and we see ourselves in the story of Scripture. How often are we tempted to turn away from God? The voice of the world likes to taunt us about our faith. Have you ever felt belittled or foolish for trusting in God? All the time we hear messages like the one the Rob Shaka said to Judah. We hear messages both overt and subtle that it is foolish to believe in God, foolish to trust in God. We are tempted to believe that it is useless to pray, useless to read the Bible, 
We are tempted to believe that it is a waste of time to go to church or to worship God. We are tempted to believe that there is no God or that God does not care about us. This voice of the world often tries to make us live in fear. And it is easy and tempting to live in fear. The world tries to tell us who to be afraid of. This fear can rob us of our peace. This fear can compel us into war with one another and within ourselves. What is it that you are afraid of? Are you afraid of the unknown, of the future, of losing control? Are you afraid of letting go, letting grow of grudges or resentments or worries? Do you worry about having enough, enough money or time or resources? Are you afraid of illness or death? Or of losing someone you love? Are you afraid of being left behind? Or being forgotten? Or being inadequate? Fears such as these rob us of the peace God has for us. The voice of fear robs us at every level. On an international level. These fears lead us to go to war with other nations. If a nation is afraid of not having enough or, or of being enough or of controlling enough, it wages wars with those it fears threatens it. On an interpersonal level, these fears lead us into conflict and bitterness with one another. On an individual level, these fears plague our minds and our hearts and they steal our peace. Fear robs us of God's peace. When King Hezekiah was being taunted and tempted, when King Hezekiah was worried and afraid, when King Hezekiah didn't know what to do or what to think, he acted with faith. He turned to God. He prayed to God. And he had Isaiah pray for him. Isaiah prayed for King Hezekiah and for Judah, and God took care of them. The enemy was turned back. War was averted. And the people lived in safety and security. Let me tell you, it is not foolish to believe in God and to trust in God. It is not useless to pray and to read the Bible. It is not a waste of time to belong to the church and to worship God. There is a God, and our God does care about us. Our God cares about you. Our God does not want us to be afraid or to worry or to be at war with ourselves or with anyone. Our God wants us to have peace. Our God gives us peace. Our God is our peace. In Jesus Christ, our God came to earth to make peace for all people. Because of Jesus, we don't have to be afraid or to worry about anything. Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead to end all our wars and our worries, to end all our fears and our conflicts. Because of Jesus, our life is safe. Our future is secure. Because of Jesus, death is not the end. We are not forgotten. Because of Jesus, there will be enough, enough resources and love and life for you and for all people. Jesus Christ is our peace. Earlier this fall, Becca and I were awaiting some test results from the doctor. Many of you know what that is like. We wondered if the enemy was at our gate. Our results came back negative. But we were being tempted to fear 
and to worry. Instead, we did our best to have faith, to turn to God and to pray about it. We prayed that whatever the results would be, that God would see us through it. And we truly experienced the peace of God. The peace of God is not dependent on our circumstances. It is ours no matter what is going on in us or around us. The peace of God is not dependent on life circumstances. So when you are being taunted and tempted, when you start to worry or fear, as we all do, when you don't know what to do or what to think, have faith. Turn to God. Pray to God. God will take care of you. God has peace for your heart and your mind. Through Jesus Christ, God's peace is yours no matter what is going on in you or around you. And through people like you and me, God is bringing peace to our world and peace to the nations. God is bringing a day when nations shall not lift up sword or gun or missile or bomb or nuke against any other nation. God is bringing a day when we will beat our swords into plowshares, our spears into pruning hooks, our weapons into acts of kindness, our hateful words into handshakes. God is bringing a day when we will not learn or study war anymore, starting with you and me. Instead, we will walk as one in peace in the light of the Lord. Together we lay down our burdens, we lay down our swords and shields, and we study war no more. We turn away from war and violence and aggression, and we turn toward peace and kindness and cooperation. Through Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, hearts are turning, minds are turning, and our world is turning toward less war and more peace. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.